church. In the house of the Lord today. Sister Judy, there's a, a denim to that poem that you read. Is there? Okay. Yeah, the man asked the Lord, he said, Well, what are those long grooves? The Lord said, That's where I dragged you, stick kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes so the Lord has to do that too. Amen, amen. Let me get situated here. The sermon in our Bible is the Matthew 23, verse 23. Forgiveness given to somebody 
you have authority over. Justice is fairness, impartiality, validity in law, and sound reasoning. People get what they deserve. So those are kind of the two basic meanings of justice and mercy. But as I was thinking about these things, okay, what is God's justice? And, the, and in my studies, I found out that God is a God of justice. In fact, uh, some of you sometime in your life may have had a lesson taught you about the, the attributes of God and the 12 attributes of God. And one of those attributes is God is just. Isaiah 61, 8, the New Living Translation says, For I, the Lord, love the justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. God's justice comes out of the fact that he is a holy God. He is perfect. He is right in all his ways. And so anything that is of wrongdoing, something that, that is, is selfish and wicked is contrary to the nature of God. Deuteronomy 32 and 4 said, uh, this is what Moses observed. He said, everything he does is just and fair. He is a faithful God who does no wrong. How just and upright is he? So God does not only have justice, he is justice. He is just in his nature. And because of that, we find Romans 2, 6 through 11 says, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew and for the Gentile. God does not show favoritism. And that verse goes along with what uh, Brother Mark was teaching this morning. God is not impartial. And we were studying about Cornelius, the Gentile, and how God had to work past Peter's prejudices and, and, and uh, social customs that he was raised in to get that Peter to, to the house of Cornelius to preach to him the gospel. But God does not show favoritism. Also on this slide, it's going under judgment is justice in action. In fact, in some translations, the word justice has the word judgment in there. They, they go hand in hand. Uh, justice is not served until a judgment has been executed. So, so a judgment is justice in action. But I, I want to kind of highlight one scripture here. It says, To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Notice that word persistence. Those who by persistence in doing good. One of the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed or happy are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know, one might ask, How does a person either fall under justice and judgment or under mercy? And one of the things that we... we come to understand that, you know, we as human beings, we tend to look, look at the external, the what was done, to try to determine why, and, and you know, the, the external facts of the matter. But when God judges, he looks at the heart. He looks at the desires of the heart. And he says to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality. And, you know, we, we have to understand that God looks at what, which way we lean, which way our heart pulls toward us. And 
the, our understanding of justice, you know, as human beings, we, we all have a sense of justice, don't we? And Mark mentioned this morning about, you know, uh, uh, his difficulty with individuals who are child molesters. And, you know, even though sometimes, you know, they, yes, God can forgive and clean up their lives, but sometimes uh, we have our own sense of justice. And I found this, uh, uh, it was an article on the internet, but I, I, I'm going to quote a paragraph that was out of it. It says, having been made in his image, and I must you understand that when God created Adam and Eve, we were created in God's image. Having been made in his image, we humans long for moral justice to prevail upon the earth and are outraged when we see injustice happening around us. Why do we seek justice for crimes? It's in our DNA. King David's outrage when the poor man's land was taken away by the rich man resonates within us. 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 4. That's why Nathan told the story to David in the first place, because it revealed David's own injustice by taking Uriah's wife from him. David's immediate repentant prayer was effective because by admitting his sin against God, he acknowledged the righteousness of God. The Lord told David though, through the prophet that even though his sin was forgiven, the child resulting from that adulterous affair would die, demonstrating the fact that his sin still had to be judged. God is a righteous judge, and God is a God of justice, and, and we should be able to understand that just because we have a sense of right and wrong within us. So let's look at some of these things. God is a God of mercy. Psalm 86 and 5, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy to all them that call upon you. God is rich in mercy. And I found this little slide. I thought this was interesting. It says, Justice is the grammar of things. Mercy is the poetry of things. Now, some of you may enjoy poetry, may read it, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how beautiful some people can arrange words, and uh, there, there are some, some words that can, uh, you know, poems that can really evoke some emotions and some feelings and, and do it in such a, a beautiful style. But, but if it wasn't for grammar, if it wasn't for the fact that we have sentence structures and laws, of, uh, you know, I mean, uh, if we didn't have grammatical laws and I just stated things the way I wanted to without following any form or fashion, you may not even be able to understand what I'm saying. So we, we have to have a basis or a structure to, to, to even make sentences, but, but poetry is taking that structure and arranging it into a beautiful way. So justice is the grammar. You know, we cannot really have mercy unless there's justice. Because if there's no justice, then there's no need. For mercy, mercy is is something that is bestowed upon an individual that has been found guilty, has found, been caught in wrongdoing, and they don't get what they deserve. A couple of, uh, scriptures here. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. I'm thankful that, yes, God is just, but I'm thankful that he's merciful. Because if he was only just and there was no mercy, where would we be? We would have to pay the penalty. And the fact is, the whole message of the gospel is that God provided the means that his own son paid the penalty. You know, justice demanded Retribution, justice demanded payback. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But but though justice had to be served, God made a way for us in his mercy that we would not have to pay the penalty of our sins. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ 
even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And so I, I found this quote uh, some time ago, and I thought it was good. It says, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, and grace is getting what you don't deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. We all deserve death because of the wages of sin and death. We're all sinners. We're all born in sin. We're all shaped in iniquity. But thanks to God's mercy, we did not get what we deserve. We got forgiveness. We found forgiveness and and. Uh, and remission of sins at the cross. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. You know, God's given us the promise of heaven. He's given us his spirit. He's called us his own sons. He, mercy takes us more than just not having to pay the penalty, but, but God embraces us and makes us his own. And so uh, the, the beautiful picture is that even though God is just, he is a merciful and just God. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this concept of, of justice and mercy. I want to read to you Romans 13, 1 through 7. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whosoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he, listen to this, for he is God's minister for you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and an avenger to execute wrath on all who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of you, you should also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. So just like you pay tithes of the church to support the ministry of the church, Paul says you should pay taxes to support that ministry. The you know, ministry of uh, uh, and, and it's that calls them ministers to you for good. Render therefore all their due taxes to whom taxes are customs, to whom cast customs fear, to whom fear others respect, honor to honor to whom honor. So notice what he says here, for they bear not the sword in vain. You know, there's a lot of discussion in our country today whether capital punishment is right or not. In fact, I think it was Nevada or one of the western states just recently banned uh, capital punishment, you know, of, of the voters voted it down and so forth. And, but yet, in the New Testament, not Old Testament, in the New Testament, Paul tells us that they are ministers to what? To execute the wrath of God upon wrongdoers. And so, this, you almost see like you know right hand and the left hand you've got you've got two ministries going on in the world today. You have the ministry of executing judgment and 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 uh, you know getting people to do what's right, but then you have the church on the other hand. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, that has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So you, you, on the one hand you have a ministry of judgment and punishment, then on the other hand you have the ministry of trying to get people reconciled and showing and extending the mercy of God. And I was thinking about this. You could have someone that's involved in both ministries. You could have, it's quite possible that you could have a local policeman who, and on his daily job, he's out there, you know, enforcing the law. 
but he could be a Christian and he could come to church and at the same time he could be witnessing the people and inviting people to church and, and trying to get them to come to Christ. You know, so there's there's two ministries and we have to understand that that, that God ordained human government. And remember after Moses, uh, not Moses, Noah got off the ark, God said, if any man kills a man, then he by man shall be put to death. For he has, he has uh, you know, spilled innocent blood, talking about the, the you know, shedding of blood. And, and you know, we, it, every individual represents an image of God. So when you, when you commit the crime of murder, you're, 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 it's a crime against the image of God. And remember, God allowed Cain to not to suffer the consequences of killing his brother. And what was the result of that? By the sixth chapter of Genesis, just before we enter introduced the no, the Bible says the world was filled with violence. And a lot of people will try to debate you on this, but I think it's very clear from the scripture that 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 the only way that to deal with violence in the world is to is to bring judgment against it. And we cannot just let wrongdoing just slide by. Let's go on here. I'll come back to this. Romans 11:22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On the, now, he, what, what Paul was right here was talking about how that you know the Israelites in the wilderness they disobeyed God, would not believe Him, and and, and God brought judgment several times in the in, in the story of the Exodus. God, one one time he he opened up the earth and swallowed all the followers of of Korah and and. and brought judgment from them. And there was other times when because of unbelief, all the generation that came out of Egypt died off and they were not allowed to enter into the promise land. And so in this discord, this he said, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell severity, but toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness. We have to make a choice. We have to desire God. We have to desire the things of God. We have to desire, we have to hunger and thirst after righteousness because we do not want to fall into God's judgment and, and his severity. I found this on the internet and it says the psychiatric community chest, get out of judgment free. Nullify 2 Corinthians 5.10 which says, for we must all judge we will each receive whatever we deserve for good or evil that we have done in this earthly body. And going back to the, the, the subject of capital punishment, why, the reason that we are where we are today is because maybe back in the 50s and 60s, there was psychiatrists start to, you know, the, they started to, to start telling us, well, you know, we shouldn't put men to death, that teaches society violence. In fact, I remember uh, Dr. Spock said, don't spank your kids, because if you spank your kids, you'll teach them violence. You know, we have this whole generation that's come along, don't bring judgment. We actually, we, we, we live in a society that is in denial of judgment. They deny the judgment of God, that there will be a judgment, and therefore we are in denial of judgment in our own society, and and uh, we, we do not, you know, I can remember when I went to school, if you did something wrong, you got sent to the principal's office, and, and he did have a paddle, and I <laughs> confess, I, I got that paddle a couple times, you know, they don't do that anymore, oh, don't, don't harm the children, you're teaching them uh, that, that violence and, and is, is, you know, force control and all this kind of stuff. And, and we just, as a society, you know, the Bible teaches us to, to, to punish our children, not abuse them, but that we should punish them. Why? Because it teaches them that there are consequences to their actions. And the same thing with society, because we have, you know, prisons and, and, and the, the death penalty, that speaks to society that there is consequences to not living as a responsible citizen and respecting the lives of those around you. And so, you know, 
the, the, the psychiatrist said, well, you know, it wasn't this guy's fault that he killed this individual. It's because his mama did this, or his daddy did that, or, or he grew up in this neighborhood, or, or you know, they, they want to pass the blame on everything else and, and, and negate the responsibility of the individual. But you don't find that kind of language in, in God's word. The soul that sinneth shall surely die. And so we have to understand that there will be a judgment. You are free to choose. You are not free from the consequences of your choice. And the scripture I have here is don't be misled. Or I'm sorry, the, the scripture the slide has. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. And in the King James it says, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We have to understand there is a law that God, just like the law of gravity and, and all the different laws that makes the universe work, there is a law of sowing and reaping. And, and if we sow to our flesh, we're going to reap of the flesh judgment and destruction. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Deuteronomy 30 and 19. Do we dare take God at his word? We all have a choice. The scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. And so, how do we get on the side of God's mercy? How do we follow his goodness and, and, and continue in his goodness? Well, we have to learn faith. We've got to have faith in God. That's what, remember what Jesus said. Justice and mercy and faith. We have to develop a trust in God and we need to follow him regardless of what the circumstances of our life. So many people react and respond depending on what they perceive as, as their, their answer. And, 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 and they, 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 a lot of times it's, it's just what seems like the right course of path, the right path to choose. But, but God, if we'll put faith in him, we'll, not, we'll seek his will. He will guide our paths. Another thing that we can do, John, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, it's God's pleasure to forgive you. God loves to be reconciled. God loves, loves it when we come to him and instead of making excuses and blaming others and pointing fingers and all that, if we can just accept responsibility for our own actions, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Another thing that Jesus told us in the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you want God's mercy, you need to learn to be merciful. And, and not just to people that have wronged you, but as in this slide it shows, the Samaritan man had no obligations to that man that was beaten and wounded and laying along the side of the road. In fact, two men had already passed by and deemed they were too busy and, and uh, too, uh, this was too much trouble and, and uh, that's not their problem. And, and, you know, a lot of people just want to shrug their responsibilities and, and say, it's not my problem. But but here this, this Samaritan man saw this this, this wounded man, and what did the Bible says? He had compassion. There was something in his heart, and that's what God is looking at. He's looking at our heart. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I found this slide, and I, I liked it. It says here, sonship, because I am secure, I have no need to keep a record of wrongs or to condemn others. 
or slavery, or I would say bondage, the only way that I can be sure, sure of coming out on top is to exploit your weaknesses. Luke 8, 6, 36 through 38, it says, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father is merciful. Not, not and ye shall, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the verse there. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give to your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, shall it be measured unto you again. And that's not only standing in judgment. That's in this life also. Give, and it shall be given to you. God, there, there's a, just like... Reaping and sowing. God has has set up the spiritual realm that when we give, God makes sure that it comes back to us. When we forgive, God forgives us. This is an interesting scripture from Micah 6 8. It says, He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Look at this. To act just, justly. We were talking about justice. And to love mercy, the other uh, side of that balance. And to walk humbly with your God. So, yes, God is a God of justice and that he's a God of mercy. And the Bible says that we should continue in his goodness. So just as a recap, here's a prescription for receiving mercy and not falling under God's judgment. When we, we share those scriptures, seek God's will. Have faith in God and follow after him. Confess your sins. Be merciful. As in Micah it says, love mercy. Act justly. That word act justly is Doing what's just, other is doing the right things. And lastly, to walk humbly with God. And I, I'm sure there's probably a lot more to this subject, and, and it took me a while to try to get my mind wrapped around it. And, and even as I was finishing up this lesson, I just kind of felt like there's probably deeper things here that, that probably I haven't even seen yet. But this, this, Jesus says these are the weightier matters of the law. These are the most important things. We have to understand that justice will be served. You know, sometimes it upsets us when we, we perceive that somebody's got away with something. And it just seems like, you know, they, you know, they threw it out of court because of lack of evidence. Or, or you just have, you, you, you know that person's guilty, but you know, there's just no way... To, to bring that person to justice, but you know it's not all said and done yet. You know there there is going to be a court session someday called the Great White Throne Judgment, and God who sees all and knows all and even sees the hearts of men, He will be the judge, and He will sit on that throne, and He will recompense men for what they have done. But I want to be on the mercy side. I'm guilty of sins just as anyone else. And I want to be on the mercy side. And God has shown me in his, his word what I can do to obtain his mercy. And I think it's, it's a, a subject that's vital to each and every one of us. We all want to come in on God's mercy side and stand
God to help us to see through his eyes what he loves in that person. It doesn't mean that it's okay what you did, but I love your soul, and your soul matters. And it's God's business what he does between that person and 